You're the cameraman. <laughs> we are the talent. <laughs> talent. 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 Um, uh. This week's Scuba Tube is sponsored by Dives Before You Die. Hi guys and happy hump day. Uh, so don't worry, it's almost the weekend. We're pretty close. Really? Hump uh. day. Hump day. <laughs> Uh, so let's jump straight into the news. So a tiny underwater drone has been released. Uh, this small robot has been created by the guys over at Toshiba. Uh, the robot is going to roam the waters of Fukushima nuclear power station. Uh, the drone will help with decommissioning the uh, sort of process of the uh, of the plant after it um, had a little accident. Just a little accident. <clears throat> Just a tiny accident. Um, but talking about tiny, this underwater drone is only about 13 centimetres long, uh, but the size... <laughs> it's 13 centimetres wide. 30 centimetres long. Oh, sorry, I read that wrong. Okay, so it's 13 centimetres wide, um, and yeah, 30 centimetres uh, yeah. long. So it can fit down sort of small places. Yeah. Uh, it can get into all of those sort of any small tight spots uh, that, uh, yeah, sort of bigger ROVs can't get to and really? where obviously people can't go um, and that gives them a, a, an overall picture of the uh, of the damage of what actually happens and uh, what's in there. Uh, so the power station leaked six years ago um, uh, and a lot of the reactors have of course not been seen since uh, and this is where the little fella comes in. The robot of course has uh, front and rear cameras so it can look around. Uh, it's been designed to withstand all that sort of nasty radiation um, and is uh, powered using a single wire uh, because we all know drone batteries are pretty rubbish you don't want to, you don't especially want to... if it's a GoPro drone yeah. they've just they don't even they, they just drop out of the sky a branded, yeah non-branded drone <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah so uh, so it's it's sort of surface connected and uh, sort of wires so it's not battery powered it will go into all the little places and then they can just kind of reel it back in yeah it's cool well, yeah, uh, so uh, so it aims to uh, to hit the waters early this summer to uh, to check out Fukushima and uh, see what's actually there. So that then they can make plans on how to fix it, and not turn it into the next Chernobyl. Just put a big tent over it like they're doing, and then paint it blue and green. Like nothing's there. Nothing's happened. Put me, no, put mirrors on it. Big glass dome like. No, what they yeah, well, what they need to do is like what Donald Trump wants to do with the ball, put solar panels all over it. So it's it's in the the core on the inside is like highly radiated, but the outside it's all solar and green. <laughs> That'll keep the liberals happy. <laughs> Put the word solar in front solar, of it. Solar, yeah, solar <laughs> radiation. It's fine. Aquarium debate. So ethics, emotions, and money are mixed all in together into this hot debate. So as of this recording, the Vancouver Aquarium are not allowed to keep whales, dolphins, porpoises on display. Thank you very much, Train. Yeah. Uh, um, we've only two whales left in the site, which are called Chester and Helen. So Vancouver, uh, Vancouver Aquarium are now trying to overturn the verdict for the welfare of their animals. Now it goes without saying that Vancouver Aquarium have an amazing track record of rehabilitating uh, sick or injured whales and release them back into the wild. That's yeah. kind of, this is where the debate gets a bit iffy um, and this is where it kind of things, but yeah, releasing them back into the wild. But the problem is because they've stopped the actual aquarium itself, they're not allowed to have whales. The whales and the porpoises and the dolphins and everything that are injured and can't go back into the ocean, yeah. they're a bit stuck. Yeah, this is the gray area. Yeah, this is where it's a bit hot because yeah, it's where, where do they go from now? And that, as I say, that's the key for the debate. What is actually better for the animal? If the animal that's injured um, gets released back into the wild, it's a higher chance it's either going to die or yeah. it's going to come back to them. Yeah. You know, so th there is that. Um, so, you know, it might actually have a better life, dare I say, in a pen or in a pool for humans to watch in conservation. Yeah, and I mean, it's, it's a very select case. Mm -hmm. um, and if you set precedent, that means that other people might try and use that loophole and say, like, oh, well, Vancouver yeah, did it, so we'll yeah, just capture exactly. it. So it's wow. really, yeah, it's, it's, it's a really tricky, tricky matter. Of course, a lot of people saying that the only reason why they want to keep the aisles is because it brings in revenue for the aquarium. They sell tickets, the more tickets they sell, the more money it gets, yeah. the more profitable it is. Yeah, it's it's a really weird one, like, because obviously you, you have the whole fiasco with sea life, and <laughs> sea world and all that sort of thing. Yeah. You know, them harming the animals, but Vancouver's slightly different because 
It's more rehabilitation. Yeah, exactly, exactly that. Um, it's a really tricky one, but then obviously they've got to sell tickets, they're an aquarium, they have... Well, they've got to pay staff, they've got to yeah. buy the food and whatnot, so yeah. they need that kind of revenue. Yeah, it's, um, no, yeah, it's just whether you think these wild animals should be left in the pit. Right. Yeah, it's a, it's a tricky one. Anyway, let us know what you guys think uh, in the comments below. Uh, so, diving the condor. Diving the condor is known for its murky waters. Uh, because of this, divers have a tendency to bump into parts of the ship uh, because of the low vis. Uh, but thanks to the Department of Natural and Cultural Resources and the North Carolina's Underwater Archaeology Branch... I told you there was no long words or sentences in this one. Maybe I should have put it. Um, the, uh, the Civil Warship has been mapped and declared a heritage dive site. That's cool. Yeah, that's good. Uh, so divers can now use the maps to navigate the wreck, uh, which should lead to, uh, to divers... Should lead to, or should... Should lead to, uh, yeah, should lead to divers... Uh, bumping into the wrecks being greatly reduced. reduced. Uh, we hope. Yeah. Uh, a lot of dive computers nowadays, they're getting the colour screens and you can actually upload maps onto yeah. it, so you can sort of... Yeah, That's so, cool. the problem with this one, obviously the condor, is that it's only visible slightly at certain times of the year. So it's so much like apparently they're exploring the area and there are so many other shipwrecks around there, but they can't they see just them can't see it, because of it. the low vis. <laughs> and yeah, as I say, the, the damage that's happening to the ship is mainly because of obviously the general currents of the ocean, but mainly divers going, doo -doo -doo -doo. Yes. oh no, <laughs> I've literally just swum or dove into part of the ship. Uh, so to find out more about this site, we put a link down below in the description. Uh, it's, it's a cool little dive. Yeah. I'd say, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very popular, hopefully it'll be more of a popular dive, it's showing an, a new site, and the more, the more dive sites get these maps and this sort of thing, the more divers go there, that means more divers can be explored, that means then more sites can be explored, then just just generally the understanding of dive wrecks is a, yeah, it's a yeah. massive thing. It's cool. Uh, so this week's ad isn't a uh, Simply Scuba product uh -huh. per se, but a Simply Scuba service. Uh, so now, did you know that we offer a regulator assembly and testing service? Uh, so whether you have new regulators and you just want them assembled for the first use, or you want us to take a look at some old regulators, we can do that. Uh, so our team is fully qualified and certified to carry out these tests and fittings. Uh, to find out more, click in the link in the description below. Yeah. A lot of new dive I remember when I first bought my uh, first set of regs, I didn't know how to put them together. And um, it's, it's just, if you do it right, it's quite an easy job. But if you do it wrong, you've ruined it. It could be messy, yeah. So, yeah, it's just about assurance. If you're not too sure about what you want to do with the regs, or if you literally want to, I want to pay for these, pay them whatever money it is just to get them regular. And then but when you get them, you literally Whack them to your cylinder, they work, and away you go. Everything's going to be tested and everything like that. So yeah, it's a it's a cool service, and you should totally check it out. Yeah. So if you like drinking seawater, then you have some competition now. MIT have just created Open Water Power, or OWP for short, which is basically a, a new system where you can create electricity from seawater. Yep, yeah, it looks like a big box battery thing. Yeah, it looks like the latest water. Xbox. One X box one, yeah, one X. Water goes in and electricity comes out. Yeah, it's powered by science. I know. Um, so the OWP will help power underwater vehicles, helping them better perform underwater. Yeah. Um, you, you think about it, they don't need to come up to the surface. Literally, the, yeah. the battery packs there. Battery never runs out because it's surrounded by like salt current, water. Yeah. Um, Genius. Yeah. Uh, at this moment in time, the OWP is being tested by the US Navy, uh, and they've started replacing regular batteries on sensors, on uh, sort of subs, uh, UUVs, uh, giving them longer bottom time and riptide or uh, autonomous systems. <coughs> Uh, of course, this is only the start of things. If it's successful, we'll start seeing more of these sort of OWPs in our day-to-day -day lives as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, I got an email a couple of years ago from a, uh, I think they were like a startup company, and they were actually designing or trying to pitch this torch that didn't have batteries, it just had one of these like OWP cells. Um, and yeah, your dive torch was powered by salt water. Cool. Which just... Was that from the Nigerian princess? <laughs> <laughs> I reckon it was. No, he, he was fairly legit until I was asking about was his what. Name Mustafa. Or no, something. I was asking about how what what if it gets like clogged up by like algae and silt and stuff. He's like, it doesn't. 
It runs on unicorn tears. <laughs> Salty unicorn tears. Um, so yeah, so uh, so we won't talk about the science because one, I don't really understand. I didn't go to MIT. What? <clears throat> Uh, and uh, and to the, uh, the this video is already getting sort of long enough. Uh, so I've put the link to the MIT uh, sort of article below in the description. So click on that if you really want to nerd out and learn about like underwater oh, have minerals. You, have you put it there? Have you? Uh-huh. You, not I'll, me. I'll get right on that. Yeah, all right, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Deepest dive in Antarctica. 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 <laughs> yeah. So photographer Lawrence Ballista. I've completely said that wrong. Nice Ballista. one. Ballista? Ballista, yeah. yeah. Has just completed the deepest dive in Antarctica. Uh, Laurent, with another photo photo uh, photographer, geez, put my teeth in today, Sean. Uh, Vincent Molnar dive 230 feet or 70 meters in the ice cold waters. What shocked Laurent was how much life actually thrives in these cold temperatures from emperor penguins, feathered stars, whatever that is, uh, and yeah, pepper stars. Well, yeah. <laughs> and and you know, jelly jellyfish. And, you know, and they're all loving life and thriving underneath there. He had to wear four layers to keep him kind of warm. <laughs> yeah, um, warm. Warm, yeah. <laughs> just, yeah, probably had to wee in his suit so many times. Just want to warm my legs. It's a dry suit. Yeah, four yeah, probably four dry suits. Oh. Um, yeah, so we had to do that. And then when they were on the service, the actual overall all the kit that they were carrying weighed around about 200 pounds each on each diver. The temperatures of this deep dive affected him so much that even four weeks later, he still can't feel his toes properly um, and even in the hotter climate. So he's gone to like the tropics to try and warm up. He's like, I, I can't no. feel it, it still feels cold. Um, apparently though, he's damaged his nerve endings and his feet won't feel normal for around about another oh. seven months. That's how cold it was down there. <laughs> So you want to be a public service diver. No. Pretoria Rescue Divers uh, have just had an interview with the Journal Star talking about their experiences diving in some rather nasty locations. <clears throat> uh, so from creeks, rivers and even golf ponds, these guys really do have to sort of go through the loops when diving. They just, if, if they need to go in there, then you go. Mark. <laughs> um, so what's the worst place that they've dived so far yet? So, well, in fact, golf ponds seem to be the worst. Golf ponds? Yeah, I thought it would just be like a whole bunch of golf balls they're just sifting. Yeah, through. do you reckon there's hard times for that diving crew? It's like, oh man, what, a pound a ball or 50p a <laughs> bowl. Uh, so they might look all nice and clean on the surface, but the waters tend to be filled with chemicals and fertilizers. Apparently it's got so bad over the years that uh, when they're having to sort of go diving in these ponds, they uh, they treat it like hazardous material incidents. <laughs> Proper like rubber Viking suits and everything. Uh, full face masks and just covered. And, and all, they're, all they're doing is going to a golf site because what the hell, why would they need to? Well, like some drunk golfer just fell in the lake. Maybe. Uh, so uh, they go on to saying in the article that people don't realise where human waste and chemicals actually end up. And sadly, these guys, you know, find it and have to dive through most of it. Um, so you still want to be a, uh, a public service diver? No, I didn't um, want to be. I mean, it was bad enough when that dive site a couple of, couple of weeks ago, last month, it, had, it sprung a leak and poo was going into the river and people were diving in poo. I'm like, Ugh. Yeah, some of my commercial diver friends, they're like, oh yeah, I had to go in a septic tank. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're covered from head to toe, but <laughs> but three showers don't don't make you feel comfortable. <laughs> I have to set myself on fire <laughs> then in my life. <laughs> Uh, and now we get onto the lionfish terminator. <laughs> so uh, we all know of the uh, the lionfish epidemic over in the Caribbean right now, and uh, and everything the locals are trying to do to uh, try and curb the spread. But now there is a robotic lionfish terminator uh, that's being introduced. Uh, so this is called the Guardian LF1 lionfish one. <laughs> yeah, and it's the guard. Well, it's not. A well, technically, it's the guy. They send the Guardian, but it's not really guarding the lionfish. No, it's, it's... guarding the ocean or us. Um, so uh, the uh, the LF one is a, basically an underwater Hoover sponsored that, by Dyson <laughs> <laughs> uh, that can dive to great depths, um, down to almost like 120 meters or something, where a lot of lionfish tend to sort of hang out. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah man. 
the whole thing, they're getting a lot of divers and uh, sort of spear fishermen go down with pole spears and um, like competitions to catch as many as possible, mm. but they can't go down to those depths where a lot of them hang out. What a bunch of girls. So, um, a bunch of breath for longer. Be all right, fresh is fine. <gasps> <laughs> Uh, so launched about a year ago, the project that involves scientists, conservationists and engineers have created this first prototype which is still man controlled but clearly works. It has two probes that kind of stick out of the front and um, they basically go up to the fish and then zap it. So, uh, so that stuns the fish and then it's kind of sucked into the main chamber. And then um, <laughs> that bit is funny, it's like what's going on? Uh, look, um, they don't really mention what happens to it next but I presume it's just brought up to the surface and then disposed of. Because the news article just kind of says, yeah, <laughs> no, we, we stun them, we suck them in. What happens is there's a hole at the end, so they stun them, suck them in, and then it goes out the other side. Which is a little blender. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like lionfish pate? <laughs> Nah, we reckon that, uh, that they just bring it back up to the surface because there's actually a decent trade in um, lionfish mm. meat. It's quite a nice flaky white fish and there's, like, there's even cookbooks and stuff all about lionfish. Yeah. Um, but they'll be trying to retail these robots uh, when perfected for around $1,000 uh, to encourage many local fishermen to, uh, to hunt the fish without even getting wet. And there's zero bycatch, there's no ghost gear. Um, so it's we're yeah. So you can hopefully reduce the number of lionfish. The lionfish themselves obviously are getting captured in a humane way. Obviously what yeah. happens to them when they get out of the ocean yeah. is another Yeah. But you know, and it also as well, it's helping those, those cookbooks. Yeah, and the local fish species. Yeah, well yeah, that as well. <laughs> yeah, that, that's probably the most important thing that still is gonna feed our, you know, make my tummy full. Yeah, right now it's controlled by like an Xbox controller. Naturally. As is everything. Yeah. Um, it'd be cool if they could make like an autonomous one that would recognize it and just like and just leave them alone yeah. in the water. They just, just hunt them out. Or what they should do is they have the VR goggles on there so you can see. <laughs> you can hunt it and like, there's one. Go, go, go. Yeah. Uh, so that's it for Scuba Tube, done and dusted for another week. Uh, if you missed it, why not check out last week's Weird Wednesday? That will be in the link somewhere above us. Uh, thanks for watching, guys, and safe diving. Bye!